morning dr azhar yeah good morning sir good to see you it's actually great to see you i think we can start i i see one or two students online no so maybe we can start um, so uh, students today i have requested dr azhar parvez who is a consultant uh, medical gastroenterologist at anta in delhi with special interest in uh, upper gi and especially esophageal surgery uh, thank you dr azhar so uh, this is an open house session uh, but uh, before we start i would request uh, the students uh, that uh, please uh, follow dr anand's instructions uh, whatever he says so please all the final year exam going students please send your names to dr anand so that he can make a roster uh, i should say that this is a good opportunity for you to rehearse for your final exam and uh, we are trying to get as many uh, prospective uh, examiners for you so that you get exposed to uh, all of them so any of the student would like to start oh, sir if you allow me to i can start giving you a brief introduction of what i am okay. going to discuss so okay. that meanwhile some people can prepare their question we yeah. can save our time please please go ahead uh thank you sir for letting me participate here because it is an of course an academic session we have all residents so there are few kind of questions that is usually asked in examination so i will be pertaining to that i have few interesting videos so that if you want to see that that is also helpful and we can uh, interact and during that video session also so now if i am a surgeon i am sitting in opd generally the patient that comes to me have a referral bias majority of the time the patients are filtered means the patient who is coming to you is possibly having something surgical so it is we are talking about ca esophagus and possibly some initial evaluations have already been made like staging modalities have been done and since the disease is possibly of a modification of metastasis so he will come to you so the first thing you as a surgeon need to answer two questions question number 1 is the patient operable and second is is the disease operable so when we talk about if the patient is operable what you need to do you get the cd or the ct scan or whatever is imaging he has got discuss with your radiologist mandatorily this is your learning the two questions that you always already have answered before that the patient doesn't have a metastatic disease generally there are different ways to stage the disease initial screening is usually with a maybe an x-ray and ultrasound followed by a simple ct scan iv and oral contrast chest and abdomen but once you have decided that the patient needs surgical intervention or something with a curative intent you need a proper staging modality so if the question comes a staging modality of choice so the answer should be ideally in the current scenario is a pet ct scan with iv and oral contrast often the patients are having dysphagia if you give oral contrast they may vomit there are the risk that he might aspirate so the answer should rather be specific that you do a cpet ct scan with iv and on table oral contrast there are few things that you need to answer if the esophagus proximally is distended you get the proximal extent and this is one of the most important thing to know whether you can operate or not like in endoscopy sometime it stretches it may be longer than what you think like and it is operator dependent if they they say that incisor 18 cm and your cut off is say 20 cm now what is my choice would be i would like to see the length from crico pharynx how far it is below if it is more than 6 cm from crico pharynx in a pet ct scan or ct scan and that is very well seen if you give oral contrast and proximal esophagus distant he still is a candidate for surgical intervention because you need minimum 4 mm or at least 2 cm below 4 cm or at least 2 cm below the crico pharynx to anastomosis one question then apart from that local staging regional extension in radiology there are two things like abutment with bronchus and abutment with aorta generally radiology over stage abutment with aorta but whenever they say there is abutment with bronchus there is a membranous part of the trachea which is very thin often in this situation you need to be careful so in pericranial or supraesophageal or peri supra cranial disease must consider bronchoscopy before planning surgical intervention these are the questions once you have answered then you of course want to see the stomach status and others once you are into the state that yes the patient is operable then you decide what kind of stage it is radiological stage so if the question is very simple if you are a proponent that 
everybody should go for neoadjuvant therapy because majority of the time disease is T2 and beyond. Rarely you get something T1. So let's not discuss about T1. That is endoscopic forte here. So anything beyond T2 and above, he goes for a neoadjuvant therapy. There is no need to add up further investigation. But if you are a believer that early T2, short segment, no gross mediastinal lymph node disease should go for upfront surgery, which is one of the modality, acceptable modality. In that situation, the questions should be answered by an endoscopic ultrasound to make sure that it is T2. So endoscopic ultrasound in staging has limited access. Early disease, when we think between T2 and T3, whether he go for neoadjuvant or not, then you of course need to do endoscopic ultrasound. But if the radiology show gross mediastinal nodes, bulky disease T3 and above, a segment of disease more than 8 centimeters, these are the few things that you should answer in the examination that these patients are automatically going for neoadjuvant therapy. So in that situation, endoscopic ultrasound, by doing endoscopic ultrasound, you are not going to change the management. So the important thing is, whenever you choose an investigation, you must have this thing in your mind that that investigation should add up value and change the management or potentially can change the management. You should not investigate for curiosity. Often in examination, a question is asked, what is your investigation? So you usually um, referring to the residents, you usually say, I can do this. Never use this word, I can, because I can means you have 10 investigations. That doesn't mean that you're going to do 10 investigations. What you will do, you choose carefully. So I will or I shall be doing this and have a rationale behind this. This is where the mistake we make. I can do this. I can do that. It doesn't mean any significance to clinical management of the patient. What you do, you choose. So when you say endoscopic ultrasound, you should be having a rationale why you're choosing endoscopic ultrasound. I hope that part of investigation is uh, cleared. Once we have complete investigation, and as I told you, there is no lot of ambiguity in this situation. If it is T3 above, gross mediastinal lymph nodes disease, some T2, long segment growth, go for neoadjuvant therapy. And that includes almost 90% of your patient that you will see. So you should be able to prepare that, this answer. Once you have decided that neoadjuvant therapy, now you have a tumor board discussion. You always say we have in our institution a tumor board discussion. Generally, our principle is to consider preoperative chemoradiotherapy which is a standard protocol, cross, you should remember cross by heart, the air of, present, air of uh, publication, everything, cross, you should be remembering the cross protocol for neoadjuvant therapy. Now, in few of the instances where there have been emergence of clot, but largely these are more useful for lower one-third adeno CAs. So between clot and cross, the problem of clot is the post-operative protocol is often kind of non-compliant. So predominantly, if you see in the literature, you will also find that the flawed pre major compliance comes only through the pre-operative part. So that is always a debate that is a post-operative part unnecessary. Similarly, cross the kind of result they have shown. They have shown a good result overall with cross followed by surgery. So they have majority of time since our histology is squamous cell carcinoma. So the standard of protocol would be pre-operative chemotherapy therapy followed by surgery. Now the examiner is going to ask a few questions. When you will not give radiation? If the disease in more than 90 degree contact with aorta, avoid radiation. Generally, these are the answer of a surgeon. You should know as a surgeon, this is where you should avoid radiation because there are chances of injury or kind of uh, damage to the aorta or fistulization. Second is if the angle of contact is huge with the mainstream uh, uh, membranous part of the trachea, again, radiation should be carefully used. So these are the few things that you should uh, be able to answer when you choose ke only chemotherapy or chemoradiotherapy. Then next question automatically you invite, why not only chemotherapy, why chemoradiation? So you should be able to answer few things like, no, uh, except in few studies, addition of radiation has not shown to improve survival. However, it has improved overall PCR. So if by adding radiation, you improve PCR, surgical results are good. You know that if there is PCR patient in post-surgery histopathology, the overall outcome is good. So this is where the answer lies. That maybe addition of radiation may and may not improve survival, but it certainly improves PCR. So a bulky disease, a preoperative chemo radiation is superior than chemotherapy alone. Second question is always asked. Preoperative or postoperative, always say the compliance of preoperative result of preoperative therapy is far superior compared to a postoperative protocol. 
now the pro in the again another question is asked why the pre operative therapy is useful why it is true that you know the radiation works through free radical damage that happens to an oxygenated tissue so if the tissue is not violated by surgery that means the radiation given before surgery this is going to work better majority of chemotherapy that you add with radiation are majority of the time are radio sensitizers so that how they add up the effect so these are the few questions that are usually asked uh in the mid meantime if we have any questions sir yeah. so i can take okay. uh, <clears throat> so ankur can you come in dr ankur ankur shrimal uh, yeah. yes yes sir good morning good good very good so um, now uh, can you tell us after what uh, we have uh, heard from dr azhar in which case you will do an endoscopic ultrasound sir usually in means early stage uh, esophageal cancer only when we want to diff means uh, differentiate between uh, this t1 b t2 and t3 stage sir when means we want so how do you know that it is early stage sir when it is means involving only mucosa and some mucosa without uh, uh, lymph node involvement so can you say that on ct no sir usually we cannot see means by ct sir so let me go back to the question again that first investigation as dr azhar said will be a iv contrast and oral contrast ct scan based on the finding of ct scan how do you decide in which case because dr azhar said that in majority of our cases the disease is advanced and endoscopic ultrasound is not required but how do you decide in which case you should do an endoscopic ultrasound and what is the intent what is the purpose sir when means uh, lymph nodes uh, if we uh, if lymph nodes uh, are not enlarged and uh, if there is no means adjacent organ involvement at that time when we can uh, means uh, that in that situation sir we can go for us sir so yeah, uncle so here i would just formulate your answer that if you in imaging like in ct scan unable to see the disease so the ct scan is hardly seeing it if it is seeing is likely it's t3 if it is kind of just something thickening somewhere likely it is not t3 means it is either layer 1 or layer 2 this is where possibly it may be t2 one second in mediastinal there is no gross mediastinal lymph nodes so in the ct scan if you can hardly see the lesion no gross mediastinal lymph node there is high probability that you are talking about an early disease where in through this you know that you possibly need an endoscopic ultrasound over to okay. so basically you want to Uh, avoid neoadjuvant treatment so if there is no indication for neoadjuvant treatment that is the purpose of doing an endoscopic yes. ultrasound that it is not t3 and it is not node positive disease and as dr azhar said that by and large patients who come to us with symptoms almost all of them will have a disease which theoretically speaking requires neoadjuvant uh, treatment okay okay so, yeah so uh, let us start the operative surgery part so let me start with you only tell us about the indications for esophageal resection sir first uh, uh, carcinoma esophagus uh, so then other indications can be uh, means uh, uh, the indication you should divide not first second and third you can divide elective or emergency or something like that or even if you don't want to divide don't start with 1 2 3 because this become uh, sometime you invite questions out of that so don't start 1 2 3 you can divide between emergency and elective something like that okay sir so, uh, yes go on so then elective setting sir carcinoma esophagus and sir uh, means uh, uh, end stage of uh, ac means ac uh, this aplasia cardia like uh, uh, means uh, uh, this sigmoid esophagus and uh, Sir, others are I means sir. Sir, in emergency set, in emergency setting, some type means uh, uh, esophageal perforation with uh, means uh, when with mediated tinnitus. Uh, sir, benign condition. Although not. many surgeons or not all surgeons would resect they would do some other procedure but some may sir benign uh, tumors like leomyo usually it is 
नॉन नियो प्लास्टिक विच इज दर कॉमन इसोफेजियल कंडीशन विच वी ट्रीट वन इज मेलिग्नेंसी अदर इज एकेजिया एंड थर्ड सर कोरोज इन कोरोजिव सो वॉट अबाउट रिसेक्शन इन कोरोजिव स्ट्रक्चर बॉडी सो that makes the, so the indication of esophagectomy sir so that is a basically radiological uh, criteria what are you saying so how is the, what is the clinical criteria of end, end stage when we always add that there is there is failure of alimentation yes so, radiologically you confirm but the patient is unable to eat and swallow and there is stasis regurgitation affecting quality of life and endoscopic therapies or other therapies are failed So this is along with this radiological criteria. You understand this is end stage ecclesia, right? Yes. So you use the word uh, sigmoid esophagus. What is the other word used in relation to ecclesia? Another term. Mm-hmm. What is mega esophagus? Uh, sir, uh, when the diameter of the esophagus. What is the, what is the difference between the two? Mm-hmm. Is more than. I am not completely sure, sir. More than ten centimeter. Is, is it ten, Doctor Azhar, or six? Six centimeter transverse six diameter. Centimeter. Maximum transverse diameter six centimeter. Okay. And what is sigmoid esophagus? What is the difference between the two? I think it's when excess deviation is there along with mega esophagus. It yeah. is called sigmoid esophagus. So, uh, uh, would everyone do a, a first stage direct? upfront esophagectomy if you see a mega or sigmoid esophagus or are there different views but on mega esophagus one means different means we can go for trial of sir poem also uh, before surgery sir before esophagectomy sir mm-hmm. if it fails then we can go for sir esophagectomy not all patients we can directly go for uh, this esophagectomy sir Hmm. Sir, so generally, uh, poem has come recently. Even before poem, there is initial attempt of myotomy, long segment myotomy is advisable. But you tell your patient that it you might fail, and you fail, then of course we have options of esophagectomy. That is what generally I think the answer should. Yeah. So you have both approaches. One could be that based on clinical, radiological, and uh, uh, manometric findings, you say that. the result is likely to be very poor after a myotomy or a poem radical myotomy or poem and you go for direct esophagectomy other is that you want to give a smaller procedure a trial and see if it works and if it doesn't work then you go for esophagectomy now let's come to esophagectomy for corrosive structure what is your view next student uh, anbarasu please be ready with the next question we will come back to you so ankur take this corrosive structure what is the status what is the view sir usually we don't uh, resect esophagus for corrosive uh, means no why corrosive. why not why not because the planes are fibrotic in that uh, reason so usually we don't resect and we make means from the other route we make the means esophagus this yeah, conduit so see you all know but you should give a complete answer to show that you know you should yeah. say that in corrosive injury there is lot of periesophageal inflammation which leads to periesophageal fibrosis the planes between the esophagus and especially the tracheobronchial tree that is the one which you are worried about are not clear so dissection in that plane may cause injury to the membranous part of trachea and that is why it is more more and more uh, groups and surgeons are now not going for resection and they are using an alternative route to perform an esophageal bypass rather than resection and yes. those who resect why do they resect sir because in the long term there is uh, it is risk factor for the malignancy 
that's why they try to uh, means One, the second and what is second any what other reason of course yeah so, uh, because of the root because it is more physiological and uh, more spacious that's why they they, they want to take the uh, means conduit through that root that's why they resect what no. do you mean by that route you should specify which route the transhiatal no 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 transhiatal is the approach what is the route of replace of conduit placement in when you resect the esophagus suppose you are resecting then which route you are using the so posterior medial skin so see at mch level your answer should be complete correct no superfluous words so you should have said that the after esophageal resection the route that we use that is the posterior mediastinum is shortest more commodic uh, spacious and physiological, physiological as compared to and you should again say as compared to retrosternal retro route stern. or rarely antisternal also although today i don't think anybody would be doing antisternal uh, uh, but i remember way back in early 80s uh, one case uh, when i was with dr chatopadhyay we did an antisternal uh i don't remember the reason probably there was tuberculosis uh, and i still have that picture showing the peristalsis of the colon in the uh, skin uh, so you should say all these things don't keep your knowledge to yourself show it to the examiner okay and sometime when you bypass the esophagus that esophagus is completely cut off from elementary system and you cannot do the surveillance of that esophagus so okay. there are three possible answers that you can answer in this situation Okay. okay thank thank you ankur now let us come to dr uh, uh, anbarasu so uh, tell us about the techniques of esophageal resection what are the different ways that esophageal resection can be done dr siddharth come in dr siddharth srinandan any volunteer dr meer bujtaba sham kumar Uthpal. difficult questions will not be answered anybody can just jump in so it is better the best to part sir as a student best part we fear when i was a student that asking this question may incite insult to me maybe so never have this fear among all the students even a bad question can teach you something that at least this is a bad question so learn by asking when a bad question so don't fear Uthpala was, okay upala was first waiting in iisd uh, that award uh, in the in the in the quiz mm -hmm. i think she should she should take the award she will volunteer on okay upala yeah good morning sir morning morning uh, come in come in sorry sir, i pronounce your name wrong upala that's yeah. that's okay sir no issue yeah. sir sir yes. i also had one question sir uh, regarding okay. bronchoscopy sir would you do a bronchoscopy in all supracranial lesions or is there any other uh kya to that routinely all supracranial lesion and bronchoscopy is advisable all pericranial supracranial bronchoscopy is advisable as a part of routine staging apart from that of course if there is certain indication like there is a in, in kind of an esophageal bronchial fistula then of course is absolute indication but generally recommended routinely yes supracranial advisable to do bronchoscopy in all because you know most of the time in supracranial presentation you will rarely get a t1 t2 disease it's going to be more than that okay sir yeah so putpala please take this question now the techniques of doing for types of esophagectomies uh so uh, uh, broadly there are three techniques uh, they are uh, uh, once is oringer's trice uh, transhiatal second is uh, macu uh, second is uh, i will uh, i will use transthoracic and third is macuvens three stage uh, these can be done either in open or uh, minimally sure. invasively or in a hybrid procedure so utpala can i just help you in yes, identifying sir. in a better way there are yes, different sir, ways sir. to go about it like one you have already explained yes, second in based on lymphadenectomy uh, esophagectomy yes. with or without lymphadenectomy second criteria third total esophagectomy or partial esophagectomy fourth is the type of route transhiatal or transthoracic so there are four ways you can subdivide as a exam in mch but i totally agree okay. with you what you just said fully yes, yeah carry on yes sir yes sir 
So yes, tell sir. us something about uh, transhiatal versus transthoracic pros and cons. Uh, sir, uh, um, transhiatal esophagectomy in today's uh, there in in today's era, transhiatal esophagectomy is probably advocated more for G uh, G junction type one. Uh, tumors and with distal esophagus tumors with uh, more uh, with tumors in the middle uh, or proximal thoracic esophagus uh, uh, probably a transthoracic esophagectomy would be more advocated um, the benefit of a transthoracic esophagectomy is uh, a more uh, systematic lymph node dissection uh, dissection under uh, visualization and with minimally invasive approaches it uh, the possible uh, drawback of Increased pulmonary complications is also less and almost equivalent to transhiatal esophagectomy. Uh, the benefit of a transhiatal esophagectomy is that uh, uh, there is decreased risk or decreased uh, pulmonary morbidity. So, is it that you cannot do any lymphadenectomy through the transhiatal approach? Uh, through the transhiatal approach, uh, distal, uh, distal uh, periesophageal lymph nodes can be removed. Uh, in distal mediastinal lymph nodes can be removed, but uh, uh, the the middle and proximal lymph nodes, uh, especially peri uh, uh, paratracheal lymph nodes, and so uh, some you can say here that approached. the lymph node in transhiatal esophagectomy in the MCH answer will be station. Eight, according to ISD, sta station eight, lower one, that is periesophageal and paracardiac, which is 18, and some of the periesophageal is station eight, upper one. So this is what you remove okay. in transhydro. Yes. Yes. Thank Carry you, on. Sir. So the modifications to the original uh, Oringer technique, where everything in the thorax was blind, putting your hand through the dilated hiatus into the posterior mediastinum, people have changed that after either dilating or even dividing the crust of the diaphragm, uh, enlarging the hiatus, using uh, laparoscopic telescopes, you can do the infracranial part of the transhiatal esophagectomy under vision. And that okay, is why okay. that lymph node dissection can be done. But as you rightly said, the supracranial part of the lymph node dissection uh, would not be possible using a transhiatal approach. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so... so uh, yes, sir. I will just uh, refine the whole thing. Like, yes, sir. When you choose about type, whether transhydral or transthoracic, if it is an in situ tumor, tumor uh, esophagectomy for benign conditions, there is an indication okay. of transhydral upfront. Now, second yes, is sir. if radiologically the disease is confined to lower 2 cm esophagus, maybe 3 cm or lower thoracic esophagus, no yes, gross sir. mediastinal lymph node seen in the radiology. THE is as good. But if the disease yes, is, of course, as you said, in the middle thoracic, upper thoracic, or predominantly thoracic with gross mediastinal lymph nodes, where your yes, intent sir. should be a proper staging, maybe a transthoracic would be preferable. So this is how you think. Apart from the performance studies, you will always choose. That. Like I chose, I told you that the answer yeah. you need to know is the patient operable. If the patient is having COPD, his ECOG is not good, even if. I will extend the front tire of transhydral esophagectomy in the middle thoracic also. I will not try to do a thoracoscopy or thoracotomy yeah. because whatever you do, you fiddle the chest, morbidity is higher. So there are few absolute yes, indications, few relative indications, and few preferences. What do we mean okay. by preferences? If your center is excellent in doing transhydral esophagectomy, even if you look at Oringer's, uh, Sir Oringer's paper, basically, I have no rights to say just his name. So he has done esophagectomy in all transhydral esophagectomy results are excellent. So this is your expertise also. So this is how things are. Expertise, topography, gross nodes, and performance status. This is how you choose type of esophagectomy. Okay. So Uttala, is there any difference in relation to the site of anastomosis and its outcome between transhydral uh, and transthoracic, especially Ivor Lewis? Yes, sir. In... Uh, a transhiatal as well as in the McEwen's three-stage uh, esophagectomy, the site of anastomosis is cervical. In uh, Ivor Lewis, the site of anastomosis is in the, thora in the thorax. Uh, the leak rates with a cervical anastomosis have been shown to be higher, but the implications of the leak are uh, less morbid to the patient. However, with uh, trans uh, in the thoracic anastomosis, possibly have lower leak rates than the cervical anastomosis. 
but in case of a leak the morbidity due to mediastinitis is very high for the patient any other difference any other physiological phenomenon one is leak anything else because you are anastomosing the stomach to the esophagus what else can happen uh, the thoracic about? anastomosis uh, if it is uh, it can uh, preserve a segment of the esophagus thus uh, making it uh, more physiological for the patient especially if it is done for any benign conditions is it physiological or alter physiology and why so basically you are putting the uh, uh, stomach conduit in the negative intrathoracic pressure what will happen it will pull the stomach content into the esophagus so reflux regurgitations are far higher and when the conduit is distended there is a biggest problem to manage in, in uh, trans uh, means i will lose esophagectomy if the gastric conduit is distended it has a lot of problem in terms of regurgitation and reflux Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. So physiologically, uh, intrathoracic anastomosis is a bad one compared to an acute anastomosis. Okay. Any okay. other student wants to come in? Jasmeet, Doctor Jasmeet, you want to come in? Who wants to come in to answer the next set of questions? Why should reflux be more with the intrathoracic anastomosis? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, reflux should be more with the neck anastomosis. No, it is not. Isn't it? Sir. Uh, Doctor Ajay is asking, uh, what is the? Uh, uh, I got disconnected. Now it is okay. I can hear you. Please. Hello. yes yes yeah so the the physiological basis for higher uh, reflux rate in uh, thoracic versus cervical anastomosis so this was the question because the negative intrathoracic pressure is applicable to the neck anastomosis also uh, but the thing is it is it is kind of through a inlet through which is compressed and second is distension we have seen conduit distension is more with intrathoracic anastomosis <laughs> the majority of time what happens if you have a conduit which is redundant which happens majority of time in avalues because you don't want to compromise on the size of the conduit so you try to take as maximum as possible so maximum stomach remains compared to transhiatal where you try to make a cylinder 3 5 mm 5 cm tube which distend less but that is also not entirely true what i can say with my experience that intrathoracic anastomosis my biggest problem is the problem of reflux compared to in anastomosis in the neck this is what i can tell from my experience of course and of course we try to identify the rational maybe the intrathoracic conduit may have some negative influence distension is more and then can lead to possible reflux and to add to this value is sometime if you do pyloromyotomy people say that the tendency after pyloromyotomy of bile reflux or reflux are higher sorry is is lesser if you don't do pyloromyotomy it is higher sir so in an iver lewis will you do pyloromyotomy on a uh, regular basis so the question you ask me what i would do i just do dilatation but what is the evidence so the answer to your question is in a patient of with or without pyloromyotomy or pyloroplasty there is nothing proven of one's advantage over other however on the light of evidence patient with pyloromyotomy has lesser incid lesser incidence of delayed gastric emptying how and with without pyloromyotomy the patient have higher incidence of reflux this is the answer but is it a gold okay. standard no you choose your procedure Personal lot of people would do pyloromyo pyloroplasty lot of people would do pyloromyotomy i just do finger glasses or dilatation and some people would do nothing nothing yes so any yes. data say that this is better no there is no very data. very soft data very soft data this is what is the uh, the conclusion of the meta analysis they showed there can be slight preference of this showing that but there is no clear cut advantage of one over other that meta analysis shows that has shown a personal preference bias towards thing those who are doing a dilatation they keep on doing dilatation 
those who are doing myotomy, they keep on doing myotomy and they don't have a comparison between the two in their same hands. So uh, I think there's no uh, per se uh, benefit or advantage has been shown. Those who are not doing a dilatation, they also say that they are not having any gastric dilatation post-operatively or redundancy of the stomach. So uh, there's no bias till now that uh, one should be better than another. Yeah, actually, there is a disagreement. Yeah, please, is please go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, please. Initially, there were trials comparing all these. So, uh, for the students, as Dr. Azar said, that uh, how you handle the pylorus in a gastric conduit which has been placed in the chest, whether the anastomosis is in the chest or neck, it ranges from doing nothing to just a finger or a, a sponge holder or a, a tubs dilator uh, or a Hager's dilator, as we described it, dilatation to a pyloromyotomy to a, 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 a formal pyloroplasty. So it has ranged from nothing to uh, maximum. And initially, there were a lot of trials comparing one with another uh, with uh, uh, contradictory results. But by and large, if you do not disrupt the pylorus, you stand a little higher chance of delayed gastric emptying. And if you disrupt the pylorus, there will be definitely more bile reflux. But which is better, which is not, I don't think uh, the evidence is in favor or against any one of them. But definitely, if the pylorus is not soft and supple and you can't approximate your fingers across the pylorus, then probably uh, everybody would do Definitely. something to the pylorus. Yeah. Same controversy regarding hand swelling and stapled anastomosis. Okay, let's let's come to that. So, uh, who will now come in? Uh, other students? Sham Kumar? Mir Mushtaba Ahmad, please come in. Otherwise, Ankur, maybe I, I'll come back to you. So Dr. Ajay wants to know, what are the techniques of esophago? Let us say gastric only. We will come to colon later if time permits. What are the techniques of doing the esophago gastric anastomosis wherever? Uh, so these are two techniques, hand strain or stapler. And mm -hmm. I mean, generally, we are doing uh, is using stapler side to side anastomosis. So again, see, when you are asked, uh, as a general principle, whenever an examiner asks, how do you do an anastomosis, you must take and use the opportunity to show your complete knowledge. You should say single layer or double layer. You should say interrupted or continuous. Yes. You say which suture. All these things straight away in your first go. Why should you allow the examiner to ask counter questions? So go back to the question again. Sir, uh, these are divide means we can do by two techniques, a, a hand strain or a stapler, and we are doing with using Advent Blue stapler, uh, side to side manner, and uh, with closure of the entrotomy using this uh, two two means uh, in the two sutures. First uh, PDS we are using three O for inner layer, uh, continuous manner, and interrupted cell two zero in the outer layers. So esophago gastric anastomosis is done in two layers? No, sir. Single, single layers. So you described it in two layers. You said inner and outer. What is that the single most determinant factor of esophago gastric anastomosis in your opinion? What defines your anastomosis? If you can just cut short the time. The esophageal mucosa must be incorporated, means mucosa to mucosa one. Second, it should be wide. If you're meeting these two criteria, whether you use your hand or you use your foot, doesn't make any difference. It's stapler or hand -sweep. Now everything depends on your preference. But these are the two basic principles, tension-free mucosa to mucosa and wide anastomosis. That should be the three prerequisites. And then you use rest of the adjectives, like whether you are comfortable with st stapler or open or, or sutures. What suture you use? Preferential monofilament. Single layer, preferential double layer. Some people still practice. And this is, I think, generally the answer to the question would be. And okay. interrupt, interrupted. I don't think anybody would be doing continuous or yeah. you do. A lot of people after a staple posterior anastomosis do continuous, but I never do anything in continuous. I always do everything interrupted. Okay. Uh, also, Ankur, you did not tell us 
where in the stomach you do the anastomosis Yes, so you have the stomach conduit taken up. Yes, the fundus sir. is the topmost part. Where do you do the anastomosis? Where sir. do you make the gastrotomy? Sir, at the posterior surface, sir, of the fundus, sir. Not always. Some people would do it on the anterior surface. Some do it on the posterior surface, thinking that the stomach, when it covers the esophagus anteriorly, provides a kind of serosal cover. um i don't know what azar's uh, preference is but i also prefer to do it on the posterior surface yes yeah, sir we have tried both convenience of doing posterior is also better and of course it covers but the problem is sometimes the conduit is sitting on the esophago gastric anastomosis and if in the neck it leaks it everything is falling into the mediastinum so that is one fear but yes it is no difference and whether you do an anterior or posterior there are three things or four things about conduit again Uh, let me add here that you should not make too bulky conduit. Don't take too much of momentum around the conduit. Five centimeters is sufficient. Too big a conduit is a problem, but too short a conduit is very big problem. Sometime if the conduit is too redundant in the tip, you can divide. Majority of time it is not needed. If your inlet is properly widened, it is mandatory not for arterial compromise for to prevent venous congestion every time we talk about arterial in my opinion arterial problem after initial experience goes down but if you do not do a proper hiatal uh, widening proper inlet widening the conduit ischemia is largely venous because of venous congestion so these are the few things and then whether you do anterior or posterior it is your choice and if you are making too narrow conduit the tip ischemia is very high so in this situation ankur do you want to tell us there are few things recently which people have come up to prevent immediate conduit ischemia and immediate postoperative period some intraoperative interventions people are doing would you like to add anything on this ankur or even pre operative yeah yeah ankur what are the methods to increase the vascularity of the conduit sir you know um, so i'm not sure but uh, this uh, preconditioning of the esophagus by uh, mm -hmm. already means embolizing left gastric art the left gastric artery sir what is sometime people do in two stage first stage they do all the mobilization and left gastric is divided and go back after 5 7 days but angioembolization is a good adjunct of course second is you can use some intraoperative intervention which will tell you that the conduit is good uh, sir uh, anastomosis over stand sir aha uh -huh, that is that is a disaster answer no, no, no i am not sure sir. so the answer is possibly people are using icg fluorescent uh, screening of the gastric conduit though there are some flip side remember one thing that the conduit leaks or conduit ischemia sometime can be late but if immediate if the conduit is totally compromised you would not love to anastomose that conduit and icg may give you an initial insight on if the conduit is suitable or not so icg in, and preconditioning are the two thing that you can do. in fact before icg came uh, some groups had used pulse oximeter to look yes. at the oxygen level in the blood which is coming to the tip the topmost part of the conduit venous, okay. venous blood gas analysis also yeah, yeah. so ankur uh, in order to do a stapled anastomosis what is the prerequisite suppose you want to do a stapled anastomosis what dr oringer described in the later part of his experience uh, what is the prerequisite without that you cannot do a stapled anastomosis and what stapler you use can you tell us again sir we are using linear cutter stapler with mm -hmm. uh, usually blue cartridges we are using sir mm -hmm. so what is the prerequisite because unless you have that sir, Mm. Sir, overlapping of the esophagus and stomach. Yeah. So, mm. because esophageal length is limited, esophagus mm -hmm. you cannot mobilize and bring it down. So that is fixed. It is the mm. length of the conduit that the length of the conduit should be adequate enough or large enough so that there is a significant overlap between the two. Then only you can fire a linear cutter. Can yes. you do esophago gastric anastomosis with any other stapler other than linear cutter? 
sir using circular stapler also we can do sir oh. by, by making gastrotomy and uh, means uh, tightening the anvil over the esophagus side and then firing the stapler via so, gastrotomy so where do you introduce the gun from because in the neck you have a very limited uh, space sir the true abdomen i am sir i, I have not seen this mm -hmm. what about par oral using orwell technique we can um, um, i have step. not seen so i can't explain to the students maybe you can this yeah, par oral so stapling regarding that orovil <coughs> uncle i would just say that the size of orovil that is introduced through mouth is 25 Okay, so sir. it is twenty-five uh, millimeters. So that anastomosis is kind of little narrow. So whenever there is a staple anastomosis, mm -hmm. either people are using have most of the time people are using hybrid techniques of posterior side to side linear cutters followed by anterior sutures or anterior also they staple. Like in Tata Memorial, they will do staple. Like in my case, in neck, I would do all uh, hands-on anastomosis interrupted, but in thorax. Because recently I moved into minimally invasive uh, Ivor Lewis esophagectomy, so posterior staple anterior sutures that are what we do. Generally, orovil is a good technique inter for intrathoracic or for kind of a after and but in neck usually it is not done. But the anastomosis is very small. There is a high incidence of because of its circular nature, more tendency of stenosis or stricture. Yeah, the the major advantage which Dr. Oringer described of the side to side anastomosis was that the stricture rate, which is supposed to be higher with compared to hand soon, is not there because you create a wide uh, side to side stoma. Okay, uh, let's uh, since we have very little time, let's discuss just one. the commonest and the most important post operative uh, event uh, that is anastomotic leak so um putpala you want to come in again are you there uh, yes sir yeah. yes sir so how do you suspect so we have done a, say a transhiatal there is an anastomosis in the neck how do you suspect that there could be a leak uh, sir uh, if there is any uh, discharge uh, on starting oral feeds uh liquid diet or uh, or at any point of time if there is any swelling in the neck or any discharge from the neck wound uh, and also if there is any presence of systemic symptoms along with this what are the earliest uh, most earliest most okay. sign of a leak possibly if the patient on post operative pod 2 is having some strider neck swelling so change these are all should be high index suspicion apart from what you just said okay. leak swelling and uh, then of course radiology and i don't think you should say on taking orally it can be even without even yeah, if you without, haven't yes, if you are very conservative you haven't allowed patient orally still there could be signs of leak so any discharge any inflammation signs of inflammation in the neck should be considered as a leak unless proved otherwise otherwise okay yes so what will you do suppose the patient has some redness some swelling some inflammation in the neck what will you do uh, sir uh, we will open up a bit of the neck wound to allow the discharge or any collection or any uh, accumulation any collection over there to be drained um so Akala, to we... correct that you said we will open a bit of a neck no you be radical on opening the neck Okay. Yes, sir. Let okay. it drain. Let the wound get completely open. No problem. Let it get drained first. Go. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so second is uh, 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 we will withhold uh, uh, depending on the uh, uh, systemic condition of the patient. Uh, one is we will withhold feeds uh, orally and would continue with our feeding uh, jejunostomy feeding access. Uh, I would consider antibiotics. This is not. This is not second. Okay, this is not second. First is drain. Is, yes, sir. Second is to exclude what sepsis. And yes, sir. Yeah. So you make ensure that there is no undrained mediastinum, undrained pleura, undrained abdomen, and undrained neck. Neck you have already drained. Then you ensure that rest of the things are having no collection, of course. Then you see yes, about nutrition. 
so there is always a controversy as whether you will withhold oral nutrition or not of course you okay. will start feeding jejunostomy you have a feeding jejunostomy if you don't have a feeding jejunostomy maybe parental nutrition but generally you have feeding jejunostomy you give feeding jejunostomy what about oral intake we should hold or something you have in your mind sir if the uh, uh, extent of the leak is very limited there is only small amount of discharge we can consider gradually restarting on oral liquids okay. so let me help you answering this question yes, is sir. if you don't see any mediastinal contamination of course you have investigated this patient and there is a contained leak clear liquids really? help to clear the neck wound so just clear sips of water is advisable so that the neck wound is automatically clean clean from okay yeah yeah but yes formal diet is not advisable until few weeks have passed then only you can start okay carry on okay so the the two points which you have already said what you, you have to understand that drainage is important because initially most leaks are small leaks and then you have a collection and neck being a closed space that collection will erode into the anastomosis and make it even bigger so by drainage by opening the wound by drainage by cleansing the wound you are preventing that further uh, uh, aggravation of the small anastomotic leak that is one second as we discussed earlier the biggest advantage of a neck leak is that it is a superficial leak and therefore it doesn't cause sepsis but if there is a trickling down of the leak into the mediastinum which is more likely if we have done a transhiatal dissection if we have dilated the esophageal inlet if the anastomosis is on the posterior surface so you have okay. to okay. ensure that and neck leak would give rise to local signs but if the patient has systemic features of sepsis then you should suspect that there is mediastinal sepsis and and uh, uh, that is more alarming rather than just neck leak alone okay sir then you more thing like in neck leaks one should be aware that if the neck leak is manifesting early within 48 hours there are probability of some ischemic component also very high so you need to exclude that and if there is a neck leak and mediastinal co contamination is significant sometime it is not just the neck leak it is also the staple line condo. erosion or condo erosion so these are high index suspicion you should always have and when Actually, you open the neck and if you see can see the condui generally you don't see but if you can see because the stenocleid is mastoid is mostly divided and if the condui is congested don't worry majority of time it recovers but that wound will give you an insight if is going to ischemia in subsequent follow up days in fact uh, the dictum is that very early major anastomotic leak with systemic signs of sepsis is with uh, metabolic disturbances hemodynamic disturbances is a, uh, a ischemia conduit ischemia unless you have proved that conduit is vascularized or is and, viable yeah an early indication of reintervention may be it saves the patient delay so, may not yeah, yeah. utpala very quickly how do you yes, diagnose uh, conduit ischemia what investigations so first is uh, 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 Such for I would look for systemic signs of sepsis, leukocytosis, uh, clinical we have done. Yeah. Uh, then second is as sir said by opening of the neck wound if the conduit is visualized. Third is uh, um, I would prefer to go with a uh, uh, CT scan before I go ahead with an endoscopy, sir. So I agree with you, Utpala. The first point should be the first way to diagnose conduit ischemia is high index suspicion. Yes, if the patient have on toward cardiac cardiac event immediately after surgery little we need like, to be little careful the rest is the same pattern you follow absolutely okay so you should say contrast iv contrast and han ct scan yes, yes, again your answer should be complete your answer should be correct so it is not ct yes. scan it is contra iv contrast and han because that is what will show you the vascularity of the conduit yes, and yes. then of course you do and again when you say endoscopy you have to say that very gentle very careful endoscopy done by an experienced endoscopist with minimal insufflation so whenever you are yes, doing yes. an early endoscopy after a corrosive injury after a post operative abdomen say early intra luminal bleed after pd when you do an endoscopy it has to be a very gentle very careful endoscopy done by an experienced endoscopist is not a routine upper gi endoscopy so all these words 
tell me that you have done uh, a procedure like this and what precautions you take took when you were doing it okay yes sir yes sir, yes, sir. Uh, anybody who can answer, who want to answer like after neck anastomosis before starting oral feed do you need to do a routine radiology radiological test if yes uh, why if no why sir some centers do propose the use of I'm a routine you. Your no, sir, I would not, your no sir no sir no sir i would not do a routine uh, um, uh, 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 ct with the oral uh, no you want to say you will not do routine radiological test i will not do, do a routine radiological test utpala sorry utpala sorry you said ct do, do people do ct those even those who do what do they do they sir, do just perium, a oral contrast study they don't do a yes, ct sir, scan sorry. They yes. do a oral contrast study, which is different from a CT scan. Now yes. come back. Okay. Yeah. Now, if a oral contrast, what contrast? If at all you believe in oral <laughs> contrast, what contrast you? Uh, sir, I would do a gastrographin, not a barium, because But in case of gastrographin, sometimes do not pick up leaks. But, uh, it, yes, is so But it is But safer. It is safer. Yeah. Yes, sir. That is the. Controversy with the doing because the oral Because if barium oral leaks contrast. into mediastinum, that will lead to severe mediastinitis. Yes, sir. So, uh, gastrographin is suitable if they are thinking that it may leak into mediastinum. Okay, so gastrographin. So you don't want to do it. Why you don't want to do it? Uh, hello. Yes. Sir, uh, yeah, sorry, there is some controversy into this uh, using the contrast with because if. Standard leak, you should use gastrographin. And if you are having a high risk of aspiration in the neck, then you should use a thin barium. Yeah. So if you are expecting yeah. neck leak, then you should use a thin barium rather than gastrographin. And if you are expecting a leak in anastomosal into the chest and the leak going into the mediastinum, then definitely gastrographin is important. Agreed, agreed. Yeah. Good. It's a good way to formulate the answer. Absolutely true. Okay. May I interrupt, sir? Yeah, Rajan. Yeah, Conray and all these cause severe uh, bronchitis. so preferable to use a non ionic contrast in my opinion i have seen lot of aspiration and cough when we do it uh, with conray i felt a megalumin iathalamate which is a non ionic contrast was better in fact when a uh, esophago tracheal fistula is uh, suspected a lot of people say that you should use the contrast which we use for doing a tracheobronchography because they are the least irritant to the uh, tracheobronchial tree but what dr ajay said is uh, important that gastrographin if it goes into the respiratory tract is a problem barium if it goes into the mediastinum is a or peritoneal cavity for that matter is a problem so you you so have to see you yes yeah. yeah so i think we need so, to close the to that uh, utpala's yes, question is to yes, routine sir. investigation of pre uh, before starting oral giving a contrast study or not now the leaks are majority of time clinical a biochemical leaks need not be investigated even if there is a leak and if you do a cause gastrochondria or barium it may miss it that does not exclude leak so leaks are clinical so even with an uh, imaging study you are not 100% sure so single most uh, kind of a supportive test is clinical and if you start orally and the patient is doing all right sometimes patient have a neck 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 uh, chest tubes so you know that the patient is doing well there is no need to routinely investigate with a red, uh, routine uh, uh dye study before starting orally this one last person yes ajay yeah so what is the drain you use in neck anastomosis drain in neck anastomosis drain uh, in the there neck. are few thing that is the dogma i think so what i say if you ask me today i don't want to use any neck drain because it is actually not needed but generally i use a corrugated drain for the sake i'm using it for the last ever since i've been trained to do that so in the neck i use corrugated although it is not always necessary and in the chest of course the chest tube we use majority of the time the drains are indicator drains they don't serve any other purpose than this because majority of time if there is a leak you have to either open the neck wound or you have to reinsert the chest tube that is for sure true i hope Uh, that is helpful for everybody actually uh, yeah, we had started leaving the lower one third of the neck wound open this was suggested to me by dr ibrarullah when he was with us and then we would not uh, use any drain because that would uh, decompress the wound and show any leak also 
uh, but we never can did it actually uh, we have uh, doing it doing it and opening it leaving the lower part of the wound open so these were the two techniques which were being used and then we, we realized that most of the corrugated drains available in the country are actually stiff so we are worried that it may actually erode into the into the suture line so we stopped using that corrugated drain and if we need a drain still i will use a glove finger to just make it a track coming out through the wound so that it can be seen otherwise there will nothing else. yeah yeah so azar i think we need to close we are already yes. beyond 10 thank yeah. you so much thank you so much uh, and students also there are i can see only two or three just send me a mail vkkapoor.india@gmail.com write esophagus in the subject of the mail so i will send you the chapter on uh, esophagus from um, my online book operative surgery I'm and azar if you have, you have time i will send it to you also uh, please yeah, yeah. go through go yeah. through and make corrections and comments no, no, no. i don't want any wrong no no there there may be some uh, wrong statements i don't want to convey wrong info because this is all my writing so i would like it to be peer reviewed please uh, spend some time I will and send you my email sure thank you thank you so much thank you very much thank, thank you, you ankur and utpala thank you very much we will close the session thanks thank you sir thanks. and azar we would like to welcome you once again whenever you have time any time sir thank you thank you sir.